you for the invitation to come. I really wanted to come here to, to find out what was going on, but I was told the condition for doing that is I had to speak. So I'm now speaking, but I really wanted to find out uh, what's underway, what's brewing in a field which I, from outside actually looks fairly fertile and, uh, and innovative. And, I, and I'll share some specific observations on that. Um, I'm glad that already the day has been successful because I've heard about Burn It All Down Bingo, which I'm looking forward to later, I've never been to one of those, uh, and of course the hoverboard wheelbarrows, which I've never seen, but um, probably not that hard to make nowadays. Um, by coincidence, we, we held an event yesterday with the OECD, which is the kind of developed world think tank uh, in Paris, you see the sign of the, the lovely sea there, uh, which was entirely about thinking of the innovation in terms of adoption, that it's, it's, it's probably 80 to 90% borrowing ideas, stealing ideas, taking other people's ideas, not originality, not the shiny new things. And so I, I really sort of would want to reinforce what, what you said uh, there. And I think often people get a bit confused about that. And I'll, I'll say a little, bit, um, a little bit later about what that means. So what I'm going to do is say a little bit about um, uh, archaeology. Uh, which you can then tear down, uh, a little bit about um, what we do at Nesta, uh, and a little bit about perhaps some of some challenges for the future. So as you heard there, we are a, an endowment. The E in our name is endowment. That means it looks like we're very rich because we have a few hundred million in an endowment, uh, but that generates an income which isn't quite what it used to be thanks to interest rates, which we may have noticed have been zero the last few years. Um, and then we use that for investment. We use it for grants in health, education, uh, the arts, parks, all sorts of fields, and used to be entirely UK-based, but now are actually in about 40 countries uh, around the world. Um, for me, this is a nice kind of change from the day job uh, to be part of this, this conversation. And I thought I'd start off by talking about where I live. So I live in an extremely glamorous place called Luton, uh, which some of you may have tried to get out of when you go through the airport. And, um, Luton is very interesting in all sorts of ways, but one of which is its heritage. We have uh, Woolad's Bank, which is a Neolithic henge. We have Ravensborough Castle, which is thought to have been the headquarters of Cassivellaunus, who was a leader of the, the tribes defeated by Caesar in his little uh, trip to, to, to England. Um, we have a, a, a church, uh, our main church, founded by Athelstan to commemorate the defeat of the Danes, before we thought of the Danes as being all about renewable energy and, uh, and welfare states. And just at the edge of Luton is this extraordinary crossroads of the ancient world where the Igneal Way, um, Watling Street, Irmian Street basically crossed. It's the sort of spaghetti junction, I think, of, um, of 2,000 years ago. And so an extraordinary heritage. And yet, when English heritage, there's probably someone from English heritage here, ranks uh, England, I guess, by a heritage, we come, I think, 360 out of 316, which is not a great position to be in. And for the people living in the town, there is almost no visibility of this heritage. And for the, the waves and waves of newcomers, it's a very diverse town. In a sense, the past, the riches of archaeology are almost invisible. They're not sort of there on, on the maps in digital form and accessible form, and not very much part of the education. And that kind of bothers me because I, I was actually brought up with archaeology a little bit in the blood. I took part in digs of Roman kilns. I was taken by my parents to see you know, Paleolithic uh, art and, uh, and come to believe, you know, I was brought up to believe that crumbling rocks were a good thing to like and spend time around. And I've managed to persuade my children of, of the same. And I think there's a sort of, uh, for, for me, it's kind of obvious, and perhaps it needs an outsider to say this, that it's really important to use a sense of the deep past to understand the present. We were talking the other day on the phone. For me, getting kids to look at the, the downfall of previous civilizations, whether it's you know, Uruk, uh, or for that matter, you know, the Mayans, and realize how ecological catastrophe is actually a common pattern of human history, is pretty useful to know in 2018. The discoveries over in the, in the recent years of skeletons from Roman London, Chinese, African, uh, Central Asian is extraordinarily valuable for reminding us we have never been a pure nation. The very idea of pure identity is completely unhistorical. This has always been a mongrel nation, certainly was 2,000 years ago. And if you go around the temples, 
uh, relics from Hadrian's Wall to Colchester. These are Middle Eastern, Persian, and so on. Again, our history has always been an extraordinarily open, plural, hybrid one, and archaeology helps us, or should help us, remember that, but often that is forgotten. So my interest, uh, as Lisa said, is in innovation. That's my day job. And to an outsider, archaeology seems to have had an extraordinarily um, lively history of innovation, even if in Hollywood films, archaeologists are always presented, probably in a way, unchanged since 1880. I was going to ask if there's any good film representation of an archaeologist, but that's maybe one for, for, for later. So, aerial photography, infrared, carbon dating, um, the reconstruction of lost languages, you mentioned drones, DNA, isotope analysis, photogrammetry, I probably haven't pronounced that right. Uh, you mentioned satellite imaging, LIDAR, uh, 3D modeling, dendrochronology, um, the new sort of hybrid sub-disciplines, archaeoastronomy, archaeological geophysics, archaeological medicine, magnetometry. You know, th this is an extraordinary proliferation of sub-disciplines, methods, and tools. Many borrowed, so you did not invent drones. <laughs> But you're using them very effectively. We're now, in fact, running a, a drones project with most of the big cities in England, for what it's worth, but that's, that's another, uh, another story. Um, and even if perhaps ancient deposits are not very restless, this is a field which seems to have a restlessness in it, which is perhaps surprising. And I'm even more interested in some ways in some of the experiments around collective intelligence, and which I'll, I'll come on to. Uh, in a moment, um, the Thames Discovery Program, someone's probably in this room who runs it, or Citizen, which is downstairs there, um, using uh, volunteers to, 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 to generate the data, to see what's happening, um, uh, and possibly increasing in the future to crowdfunding. We run a whole series of crowdfunding projects and match crowdfunding projects, which probably our, our archaeology could use. GlobalExplorer.org, I don't know if that is seen as a good thing or a bad thing in this community, but encouraging thousands of people across the world to be citizen scientists observing, um, uh, both seeking out uh, past settlements, but also watching out for looters, seems to be a really good way of building a new engaged community, and that is clearly innovation. Um, I spend a lot of my time these days around artificial intelligence, we invest in quite a few companies, we run projects and programs. And again, this may be very obvious to this audience, but a lot of people in AI say that almost anything visual can and should be searchable and describable. And once you do that to large data sets, um, whether <coughs> shards of pottery or arrowheads or mounds, you open up extraordinary new avenues for uh, understanding and observation. So just a few words on, on, on how that links to what we do doing this. So I think a lot of our work with different fields is about cross-pollination, helping one field borrow a method from another. And the ways in which satellite imagery, essentially pioneered by the military, has been so sort of commandeered both for ecological goals and for archaeology is a great example of that. And there's lots more to be done. So Copernicus, for example. Do any of you use Copernicus? So we spend about 8 billion euro on Copernicus as a pan-European satellite imaging project, which I think has no connections to archaeology at all, but is incredibly powerful, just waiting to be borrowed. We do a lot of work encouraging testing and borrowing of business models, uh, business models from the, 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 the platforms, the sharing economy, all sorts of different uh, tools. And often we found, with, particularly with arts organizations and museums and others, lots of scope to use new tools to get resources out of your, your community, your customers, your partners, uh, in, in all sorts of ways, including um, crowdfunding. Um, we encourage a lot of experiment, formal experiment, and one of the things crossing my mind as you were speaking earlier is we, we helped set up what's now a network of about 10 what works centers in the UK covering things like education and health and policing, which try and synthesize the state of knowledge. Because we find in most fields, even when they're full of really clever people, they're often really bad at synthesizing, curating that knowledge and making it easily accessible for the busy practitioner. 
And one of my questions to all of you is, so who is doing that kind of curation? Is, is, is it this organization or someone else? We run a lot of challenge prizes as a way to stimulate innovation. Um, and one of my colleagues was give it, doing an event on this last night. An example which might be close to, 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 to what you do is, we, we did one last year for the US government on data-driven farming in India. Uh, and the, the aim there was to come up with new tools to help quite poor farmers manage their farming using data and satellite imagery. But we opened up to uh, innovators from all over the world to help them. And had teams from Latin America, and Israel, and China coming up with new ways of solving their problems. That sort of challenge prize, I suspect, hasn't been much used in archaeology. And always the benefit there is you're reaching into the ideas of people who would never normally come think of themselves as anything to do with uh, archaeology. You mentioned the cost of innovation earlier, and some innovation is really expensive. Um, I was two days ago in the Crick Centre by King's Cross, which is Britain's new centre of genomics. 2,000 researchers, hugely expensive. <coughs> drug development is now a you know, billion dollars to come up with a new drug. But there's another end of uh, innovation, which is all about very cheap, very lean processes. India, again, actually is now a pioneer of this. It's called frugal innovation. How do you test things out without fast labs, expensive salaries, and so on? And, and in many ways, I think that's more relevant to much of, of our work than the old model of ultra-expensive, big labs, and so on. We've also been interested in, in new kinds of partnerships. So I think you might have seen a, one we did over a few years where we tried to link together arts organizations, tech companies, and universities around what we call the Digital R&D Fund. And the idea was to test new digital tools, sometimes to help raise revenues, but also to transform art forms, uh, playing around with, for example, haptic technologies for, for, for theatre or combining art augmented reality with, a, with a, a, a museum. And that was a very, very um, creative, we're hoping to do another version of that for museums very shortly. Uh, last summer I went to visit Lasco 4. How many people here have been to Lasco 4? <laughs> yeah, it's quite weird that there's a Lasco 1, 2, and 3. Um, which is, I think, really impressive. I don't know what you thought, and yet, Almost certainly, if they were doing it in three, four, five years' time, there would be a significant element using virtual reality and augmented reality to help feel what it was like to be that you know, Paleolithic um, uh, hunter in minus 15. Well, maybe they wouldn't do the minus 15 bit. But, but there's a whole series of new tools which we were looking at in these digital R&D funds for, for bringing in these different dimensions of experience and feeling into, um, uh, into archaeology. And then, as I said, I've got a personal interest in these collective intelligence tools, which the UK has been quite a pioneer of with things like Zooniverse. Have any of you have taken part in Zooniverse, which is mobilizing thousands of people to watch to find new stars. And there's other ones, you know, watching out bird watching or, or nature. Uh, in the US, I think the main one has four million members. This is a complete revolution in science where vast citizen volunteering is now the, the complement to the professional scientists and doing all sorts of things they can't do uh, on their own. So where, where does that take us? Well, um, a little plug. So I brought out a book a few months ago which tried to pull together some of our thinking on so the next generation of how intelligence will be organized. And it's from Princeton University Press and called Big Mind. And I won't, I, I won't sort of bore you with the detail, but there's two or three elements which I think are relevant to this field. Uh, there are sort of two or three primary arguments in this book, um, the first of which is really about brains. So we all hopefully have one in this room. And what makes your brain work well as a human being is it combines quite a few elements. Uh, your seeing, your observation, sounds, taste, etc your ability to, um, to predict, to have models, your ability to remember, your ability to create, your ability to judge, your ability to empathize, and so on. And because your brain is incredibly tightly in interconnected, you are able to think really effectively. In many fields, each of these functions is run slightly separately and often very unevenly. So 
I think your top thing for innovation archaeology was observation, that's fine. We are in a period where there's a, a revolution happening in how to observe, how to gather data, how to analyze data, uh, which I've already mentioned, which is increasingly uh, machine readable. There's also a revolution happening in models and trying to create much more formal predictive models, which could be models of population movements or language change, and then testing those hypotheses. We're seeing lots of transformation of how memory is organized, but I'll come to this a bit later. Memory is still often very badly organized, and creativity and empathy and so on. But in all the fields we look at, it's only when you bring those together and curate them as a single whole that you get the real leaps in intelligence, and if they're run separately, you tend to miss out. And the other crucial bit of the argument is in that process of bringing the functions of intelligence together, we need learning loops um, to help us think through changing environments. And just to explain what I mean, a, a lot of everyday thought is what I call first loop learning, where you have a model and then some new data comes in and you adjust your interpretation in the light of the new data. So when you find Richard the thirds, wasn't it, bones, you know, you try and find some bits of data which will tell you if it was Richard the third and, and so on. That, that's the sort of normal kind of loop of learning. But then we often also need second loop learning when your existing categories are no longer working in explaining the thing you're trying to deal with. And so something like interbreeding of sapiens and Neanderthals might be an example where almost a new category was needed, because my understanding is that was thought to not have happened at all uh, previously. And then third loop learning is when even that is, runs into barriers, you need an entirely new way of thinking. So something like archaeogenetics is probably in a new way of thinking, which fills a gap in terms of uh, how intelligence is organized. Now the reason I mention all of that is almost every field we work in, like health, like education, like land management, policing, at the moment it's no one's job to curate the whole system of collective intelligence. So we may have lots more data pouring in, but it's not properly linked to memory, creativity, and judgment. You see that in fields like finance, which had a vast surge of, um, of data and even of predictive algorithms, but then almost lost its wisdom and made incredibly stupid decisions, nevertheless, because of that imbalance in the forms of intelligence. So my first sort of challenge, my, my main sort of challenge to all of you is really whose job is it to be that orchestrator, that curator, that leader who makes the whole more than the sum of its parts. And that may be partly spotting the emergent innovation tools and helping to get them to the people or the places or the projects which could most need them. But some of it as well will be this linking together of different elements. Last week we published a report, which is in some ways a million miles from you, but um, in other ways not, which was about memory in government. And by coincidence, we published it on the day of the wind rush time <laughs> yesterday, when it turned out government had lost all these records. And by some happy, unhappy coincidence, this report has been arguing there's been a significant deterioration of the memory of government, paradoxically at the very moment when paper records we're moving to digital records. Uh, all sorts of things have been lost. All sorts of memory has been lost, both individual records, but also of what works and what doesn't work. And the main conclusion of the event we held exactly a week ago on it, including the Director General of the Civil Service, was part of the reason was that it was no one's job. No one had had a responsibility for orchestrating the memory as a collective asset of huge value, and therefore it has steadily atrophied without anyone really noticing until you start getting sort of scandals. So again and again, I always ask the question, you know, whose, whose task is it? Whose responsibility is it to make them whole more than the sum of its parts? And I think the final thing I really wanted to, to talk about goes back to almost sort of culture and your place in the wider public culture. Um, I was brought up to always assume that it was important to have a sense of the long view, the deep past. That was how you made sense of you know, who, who you were. Um, 
And yet I feel we're in a time when, although probably things like readership of archaeological books are going up, I don't know, other forces are going in the opposite direction. Uh, are in a way meaning that minds are closing in, horizons are shrinking. We get that in many fields, certainly in, in, in finance and business, short-termism markets, in politics, we don't know whether a minister will be there next month, let alone uh, next year. We have social media, which are almost cultivating a, an, an eternal present, which um, people live in and they just don't have a sense of, of the sort of layering of the evolution, everything is at now, now, now. And, and I think we we really risk losing something very, very important as that happens. About 10 years ago, I did a, a, a sort of proposal uh, of a, a, a sort of quite a naive way, I thought, of trying to address this, which we almost got going in Edinburgh. We did, we did a sort of beta version of, in London as well, which was to create membranes. And so I had this idea that you would try and overlay on Google Maps and anything which was a spatial mapping, um, layers of collective memory. So it might be oral history, it might be pictures, it might be the story of what happened in this pub or this house where someone was murdered or this park where there was a, a riot, but also going down to deep history to, so you would see either in augmented reality on your phone you know, what, what it might have looked like, the Saxon house on this place where you were walking, or the, you know, the massacre, there's a hill next to where I live, there was a fantastic massacre in 300 AD, you know, uh, that, that sort of thing. But you'd bring it alive, literally, uh, and, it's a, and it's, I had pictured this as a membrane, just like some of the, the theories of Paleolithic art, which now suggest that in these deep um, uh, caves, right in the, the heart of the hillside, what was happening with the sort of shamanic characters we can't really imagine, is that they, they saw these, these walls as membranes through to another world of the ancestors and the gods, and they tried probably through taking very powerful drugs and music and drumming and all sorts of things to get through those walls into the other side, a permeable membrane, but which then connected them to a sense of the past and how their past connected to them in the present and to their successors in the future. And I think one of the challenges which we haven't solved is how do we get some equivalent to permeable membrane already embedded in, in daily life of you know, like children today. So it's, it's easy for them to access through their, their social media. And I think that matters partly because it's fun. Um, I have a hunch it may also explain mysteries. I was in Turkey a couple of weeks ago and uh, met some people who've been involved in Gerbekli Tepe. Any of you know that good? Yeah, you would, of course. It's a very knowledgeable. Yeah, uh, you, you may think what I'm about to say is wrong, but the people I met were saying, and this, for those who don't know, this is now thought to be the oldest inhabited settlement, I think, on the planet, older even than Chatelhuy. Um, and it's in some ways a mystery. This is 10,000 years ago, pre agriculture, and involved 200 vast pillars, each up to 10 tons uh, in weight, being moved there. Um, uh, and nobody knows what it was for. Is it a kind of cathedral? They appear to have feasts, there's lots of bones there, but it's, it's, it's a mystery. And I guess my hunch is that in explaining mysteries like that, there's, there's a very linear, rational, analytic approach. Look at all the evidence. It's hypothesis generation, but probably also imagination tapping into tools which can help you imagine, think your way, feel your way to what might have made sense of this place uh, are important as well. And some of the new technological tools I think are, are fantastic liberators of imagination which may help us sort of Sherlock Holmes-like uh, decipher these extraordinarily fascinating sort of mysteries of our, our deep past. So, I mean, this, I'm going to be rambling on about lots of things. Um, in a way, as I say, from outside, I think this is a field which, which does a lot more innovation than many neighbouring fields. I, I, I do a lot of work with other social sciences like economics and sociology. They have been significantly less hungry, less promiscuous to borrow ideas and tools than archaeology has been. There seems to be a, somewhere in, in your discipline a, a very healthy, uh, restless uh, culture of borrowing, learning and adapting. Um, 
I think, as Lisa said, nearly always, though, the barrier is not just, it's not actually money. Money isn't usually the main barrier, or time. But you do usually need some license, some space, some um, acknowledgement or creation of, uh, of almost places where you are allowed to, to play and experiment and speculate and try things out. And I don't quite see those. I don't quite see the archaeology innovation labs. And I don't see the leadership quite driving that through and pulling the pieces uh, together in the kind of the collective intelligence tools which I get so excited about. And as a non-archaeologist, it really matters to me that you do solve these problems because I think your role in the wider culture as the guardians of the longer now, of the bigger sense of, of who we are, stretching right back into the past, is absolutely essential and we're also going to have the confidence to have a long view out into the future. And did any of you see Macron's speech yesterday in Congress? It's actually a wonderful speech, and one of the reasons it's very good is he was very overtly, with every line, attacking Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> brilliant in his presence. Uh, but, in this, but a lot of it was about our, our duty to our planet, our duty to the long now, our duty to the long sense of, of, of humanity as a, as a species, and you are one crucial part of that, so thank you.